Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. When a patient presents for treatment and the patient is suffering from bruxism or temporal mandibular joint pain function syndrome, an occlusal bite stun is used to provide muscle relaxation and relief of symptoms. This bite splint must minimally open the bite, be completely free of interferences, and maintain the occlusion stable during the course of treatment. Following the use of this bite splint, an occlusal adjustment is performed on the patient to assure a permanent relief of symptoms. I'm going to show you two methods of fabricating the occlusal bite splint in wax, and then this can be sent to the lab, and it can be made in heat-cured clear acrylic. Heat-cured clear acrylic is the most acceptable medium to use for this construction because it is the hardest. It does not absorb odors as much as cool, cold cured acrylic, and it is as porous, and the fit is considerably better. The best way to begin to learn to construct the occlusal bite splint is to fabricate the first few bite splints that one tries to make on the articulator using articulated cast. These casts are mounted on the Hano articulator because this is the articulator used at school and um, most people that are at school have one and it is very simple to use. These casts are mounted using a face bow because they will be used for an occlusal adjustment. However, the lower cast need not be mounted with a centric relation check bite. This lower cast is just placed in centric occlusion to give us an approximate idea where the lower supporting cusps are going to be in relation to the bite splint when it's finally constructed. The first thing to do is to draw the extent of the bite splint on the maxillary cast. We would like it to completely cover the junction of the gingiva with the tooth and go on to the palate for a small way to assure that there will be a seal there and the patient will not be whistling through the plastic and teeth. We do not advocate full occlusal coverage. I mean, I'm sorry, full palatal coverage. When we come around to the facial surfaces, we would like to have about a millimeter of the buccal cusp covered to ensure that they have a good content. Now this is always a good idea to mark this beforehand because the wax has a tendency to get a little bit overextended and if you have a mark you can cut back to that mark. So when we're finished, we should be able to see that mark completely on the upper cast. The next step is to determine the amount of opening one will need to assure clearance of the bite. This is best determined by opening the casts up until one can see both the buccal and lingual cusp of the lower tooth. When this is possible, one draws an imaginary line connecting the two and sets that up as a plane, and the upper lingual cusp are aligned so that they touch that plane. This way you can end up with the flattest surface. So if we look at this from the side, we can see right through you can see the lingual cusp hanging down there. The light just barely reflects on it. It's that white area just superior to that lower buccal cusp. That lingual cusp is on an imaginary plane that's between the lower cusp. And that's about your minimum distance that you can open. Now you see that's quite a distance in the front. On the articulator in the pin area, that's four or five millimeters. If this is not done, 
what will happen is that you will end up with a groove down the center of the bite splint because the splint will not be open enough and you also increase the chances of perforation in the area of the maxillary lingual cusp. The perforation is an academic point. It doesn't impair the function of the splint, but one would prefer not to have holes made because when the holes are made, the splint is thin and it begins to fracture and chip away. Now the first step in the wax preparation is to place wax in a layer completely over the teeth and within the area drawn for the perimeter of the bite splint. We'll do this now off camera and come back. Following this first addition of wax, the following point should be checked. The perimeter that has been previously marked in black should be visible on the facial surface. Wax should not extend all the way up to the gingival line. Although this appears to be somewhat jagged, this will be finished in the acrylic and need not be completely smooth at this time. When viewed palatally, one can see the outline of the mark. The wax is not extended into the palatal vault to an excessive amount. From now on, the only places that wax will be added is across the occlusal surface and in the anterior area to make up for the space between the teeth. The thickness of wax, one thickness of a pink sheet a base plate wax is sufficient to take care of all of the edges of this splint. Now when we put this together, we started out the pin was maintaining the space between the teeth. Now if it comes in close you'll notice that there is a space. I can stick the pointer underneath the pin now. This is because that single thickness of wax which is a little over a millimeter thick probably, has caused contact to occur in the posterior area and affected the separation. Now we already established that we want our vertical dimension to be at the dimension established by the pin. So we will have to close this a little bit into the wax to get us back to the correct vertical. So you would just heat a wax spatula or use a alcohol torch or some other heat source to soften the wax in the posterior area where it is making contact and squeeze it together and upon doing that now we've restored our contact in the anterior area with the pin. Now the next thing to check is the contact in the posterior areas. The first thing we want to build up is a stable, simultaneous contact of all the mandibular posterior cusp that we can possibly get to hit the bite plane. Now in lecture it's been explained that if the lingual cusp of the lower tooth is at the same level that the buccal cusp, it may be put on the bite splint. If it is slightly superior to the buccal cusp of the lower tooth, it may be put on the bite splint. The only difficulty we get into is if the lingual cusp of the lower tooth is inferior to the height of the buccal cusp, we do not attempt to reach that. A good example of this is in the area of the lower second bicuspid and first bicuspid where the lingual cusp is very much shorter than the buccal cusp. If one were to go down and try to make a contact with that, you would end up with an extension of plastic that would be excessive and would be um, unneeded. So the next thing that we will do is we will add wax in the area of the posterior teeth in such a way that we get a nice contact. Here you can see that there is a contact back here and there's a contact here. If we open it up and we look on the wax surface you can see that there is a dimple been, that has been made by the contact of that 
buckle supporting cusp. When we finish, this dimension of contact is what we're going to be striving for on all supporting cusp and as many lingual cusp as it is convenient to place on the bite splint. So now I will add wax slowly in this area. Now if you're close enough to have a good chance of making contact, one would just add wax with a wax spatula, say in this area. In this area here, we have a little bit more space between the teeth. We're going to actually add a piece of wax. So I will take a piece of wax and warm it and place it on in the articulator in this area from the distal of the cuspid back to the second molar. Now I've just completed adding another layer of wax from the distal of the cuspid back to the second molar and I'm getting a satin finish on it using this warm spatula. And we have a fairly smooth satin finish. Now this wax has been added, now there's an excess amount of wax when I close the articulator together and press it down and open it back up, all of the cusps that made contact now have dimpled the surface. So we have two cusps of the second molar, the three cusps of the first molar, the second bi and the first bi cusp that all have made marks in the wax. You'll also notice over here that the addition of wax, I have widened the occlusal table slightly and here is the mark of the lingual cusp of the first molar the lingual cusp of the second molar does not quite make contact. These cusps are not quite as high and I don't think I would make an effort to reach down and catch them because I like to have this surface come out quite smooth and undulating. Now for the wax up, this amount of dimpling may be a little bit excessive. Uh, initially one might want to leave it a little bit excessive to uh, have a sufficient amount of w plastic to work with in the mouth but in order to reduce this thickness, all one has to do is to reheat the spatula, go over the surface. This will spread the wax where you think it is thickest. You can take it off. Again, you let it harden up. You get the satin surface. Close the articulator again. And you notice that we can reduce the dimpling and make it more concise. Now that is the first step, providing the simultaneous contact of all of the posterior supporting cusp plus as many of the lingual supporting, non-supporting cusp as feasible. The checkpoint should be that you should be able to see a dimpling by all the supporting cusp and as many of the lingual cusp that you are trying to maintain contact should be visible on this. I'll now do the same thing on this side. When we come back, we'll have these two surfaces that will look pretty much identical. We've added the wax on the opposite side, and you can see that we have too much dimpling now. I've made sure that we have contact. Here's the second molar, first molar, second bicuspid, and first bicuspid. Now these dimples are more in the ballpark. We have here non-supporting cusp of the second and first molar are visible. Now all we have to do is heat the spatula up a little bit, melt the wax, spread it around, get it off the areas where it is in excess contact. Again we get the satin sheen back to the wax as it hardens. The articulator can be closed, can be checked again. You see we've reduced considerably the amount of indentation produced in the wax. When you start out with an excess, then you can just go back in, again do the exact same thing. The w reason this works is because the wax spatula, when it's hot, draws a certain amount of the wax off and provides you with reduction of total amount of wax on the surface. Again you close, open. And now we can see that we've probably got just about the same 
amount of marking on both sides. This is the opposite side. This is the second step is obtaining simultaneous contact of all your posterior teeth. The next area that needs to be added is that we'll have to add in the anterior area to get in addition to simultaneous contact with the posterior teeth, we will want all of the lower incisors and cuspids to fit into this area and achieve contact simultaneously. Now I'll close this up and you can see the amount of space that we have in here. What we need is wax down to the level of these incisors to assure a simultaneous contact with all the lower anterior teeth at the same time all your posterior teeth contact. So I'm going to take some wax and soften it up and mold it in my hand to fit into this sort of pie-shaped space. If the wax is heated to the correct temperature, it can be kneaded like dough and used like modeling clay to uh, fill in this space. You can take the wax, mold it in your fingers. Some of the areas are harder than others. The temperature evens out. You place it in the area that you want it and you spread it. This is much better than adding the wax the way with a hot spatula and getting it all over. You see, I can like using Bondo, put it in, getting it to the approximate place when it's already hard or s somewhat hard. You can see that I've closed that space quite a bit now from what was previously present. The pointer barely gets into the space, but there is still a space. So this area that I've added in here can serve as a skeleton for the additional adding of wax just as we did it in the posterior area. So this area that's been added is seared in to establish a good bond with the adjacent areas to make sure that further manipulation will not dislodge the entire area of this wedge that we've added. Now you notice that in this area here we've got an excess amount. This is a, an area that the tongue would, would play with. It would be rough and irritating. What we would do is find the extent of the contact of the upper teeth, mark that, and that would be about here. Now here's, the, here's one cuspid, here's another cuspid over here, their, their initial dimple. And then this wax can be just cut off. Now again, due to the movements of the mandible that are going to occur on the splint, as it's being worn, we don't completely cut exactly to the area of the central incisors, but we cut back, and then this area can be smoothed out, a little piece of wax added into the area to assure that we don't have any voids. We want to make sure that when the tongue comes and presses against this lingual surface, it will meet a smooth surface and come into the knife-like edge that blends in with the rest of the appliance. So a wax spatula can be used to achieve this knife-like edge and get the smooth satin finish to the wax. You notice that some of the wax, when you heat it, does go into the areas that are beyond the line of extension. These can be removed later. So now we have a smooth surface here in this area. So if the tongue comes against the palate, it has a knife-like edge of the plastic appliance to, it will notice, but it has nothing sharp to aggravate the um, neuromuscular mechanism of the tongue. The contacting surface for the lower supporting cusp of these anterior teeth should be 
smooth and the satin finish imparted to it to use this much as you would articulating paper on the natural teeth. When the surface is smooth, it's closed, contacts are checked. The best we're doing, we've got a cusp it on either side. We've got a little bit of a lateral here, and we've got a little bit of a lateral here. Now we'll add a little bit more wax in the area of the uh, central incisors. The um, best way to add these little pieces of wax is just to get a little scrap piece of wax that you have, warm it up till it gets to be the proximate temperature, and just place it in the area that you want the wax. It's considerably less messy than taking wax and putting it on a big spoon spatula and getting it molten and spreading it all around. You just place the wax on when it's in its softened consistency, run over it with the spatula to get its borders blended into the rest of the wax so it'll stay stable. When the surface again gets its satin finish, close it together and then look at the surface. And now we've got all, we have a mark of every tooth across the anterior surface of this waxed splint. Now we can just smooth out some of the ones that we consider to be a little too deep. Again, impart the satin shine. Close it again check it. And now we've got just about the right amount of contact. All these contacts are now occurring simultaneously in all areas, starting with the second molar on one side, going completely around the arch, and ending with the second molar on the other side. Now, this takes care of the initial contact in the area around centrum. This area is an area that is extremely mobile at this time because the patient is in a situation where the muscles are in spasm. They're in various stages of asynchronous contraction. The mandible can be forward, sideways, or a little bit uh, inferior of the position that it will finish following the splint therapy. So we talk about this area of centric relation, but it is a centric relation that will change as the muscles relax. So we have to make sure that you notice that here this area is the contact of the central incisor but I don't end the splint right distal to it because if I did and say the mandible moved backwards a little bit this tooth would again have no contact. We also have to make sure that we have a little bit of a flat space forward because we found that people do generally move forward on the bite splint rather than straight backwards. They also move a little bit to the side. Uh, generally the pain is on one side or the other so one joint being more involved than the other we have a little bit of a increased movement on one side or the other. The next step is to fabricate the lateral guidance that will be provided in the cuspid region. This patient upon checking the way the bite splint occludes we find that we have good provision for a cuspid rise. The patient's cuspids are quite tall, very pointed, and very easily reached. We will put a small amount of wax in this area and a small amount of wax in this area of this cuspid to provide for a lateral separation of the teeth. If this is moved laterally, the at this stage when it's moved laterally, the posterior teeth can be in contact quite a ways back. You can see that as I move it laterally, I have contact on the second molar. On this side, if I looked at it from the other side, I noticed that I also have a balancing contact on, on this side in here. There's a balancing contact in this area. So what we need is sufficient amount of wax added on this area of the cuspid to let this cuspid ride on it and provide us with disclusion laterally. So what I will do is I will take a small pyramidal shaped amount of wax and place it in this area and also one in this area and when we come back we'll have those two done for you.
Now we always put a little bit more than we need on the, um, in the area because this is the initial crude addition of wax. You can see this is quite a vampire fang we've got hanging down here. And there's one on the other side. But you'll notice that if we just look at the movement, you have to be in close for this one, in the posterior area here. This is the contact now that we have. If I go into lateral excursion now, you'll notice that we get quite an abrupt separation of these teeth. On the opposite side, as we come around, you'll notice that we now have light passing through there and the balancing contact has been eliminated. This has been done by the use of this cuspid rise. Now on this side, the same side here, we will go, again, if we come in close and look at the working relationship, in the posterior area, again, we have an immediate separation. We can come around to the opposite side. Again, you'll notice that there is a definite clearance and balancing. Looking on it head on, we can see probably if we get a little bit further back so we can see the whole thing. That's right. Now here we can see that there's light in the posterior areas. Now at this point, all the teeth hit, and then any point outside that, the teeth separate. Now this is the type of tolerance you should build into the wax splint if you want to make freedom, provide for Bennett shift, or have a little bit of side play. It's best to do it in the plastic. It's very difficult to do it in the wax because the wax abrades so easily. So you see we've got a real smooth ride. It takes very little effort and the only thing that's holding me back is the friction of the wax against the teeth. We have a very solid fit. Now, in addition, if we protrude, push straight forward, you notice that there's immediate separation of all teeth except the cuspid. Now, this patient fits into having just the cuspids do everything, do protrusive and lateral excursion. But I want you to notice what these cuspids look like in the lower arch they stick up above these, t these incisor teeth. So this point here is the point that's going to do the guidance, so it fits in very well. If you have a patient that bruxes considerably more than this patient, this cuspid may be lower than these teeth. It may be the same level so that your protrusive guidance may require contact with your lower anterior teeth. This is why we tell you we can't exactly say there is only one particular kind of anterior guidance that's acceptable. Every case has got to be evaluated carefully and ch chosen on its merits in terms of what can or cannot be done. If this patient had an anterior open bite or you felt that you were getting too much opening in this anterior area, a trick is to catch these teeth on this area here and then put a bevel coming up to the incisal edge here so that when looked at head on, there is an actual, this plastic is actually thinner than it is, but because it's beveled this way, the light reflects down. If you had this thickness coming out and down in this area, it would look considerably thicker. So these are just points of aesthetics that obviously the splint will not work if the patient is not wearing it, and if the patient is somewhat vain, um, they might not want to have, they want it to be as invisible as possible. Now if we look inside, we open this up, we see that again we've got quite a bit of wax here. This is the area that the cuspid hits, we've got all of our contacts here. Now all we have to do to decrease the amount of cuspid lift, and we've made marks here, you can see this is the lateral path is in this direction and our protrusive path is in this direction. Now, if we want this to be decreased, we can just take some, the total amount of this area, as I said, it looked quite a bit like a fang uh, before, can be diminished on the outside, anywhere outside of the area that you had that contact.
we cut it like this, it puts it more into the level of the splint. It doesn't stick out so much. Upon checking it in the sideward lateral excursions, again, you see that it rides only on the cusp. If we back out a little bit, you'll see that there's a immediate clearance. Protrusive is exactly the same way. So this is the way that you would leave it for fabrication in the plastic. This is the way you start it out on this side. So you start out with that kind of bulk, check it, make sure that it's doing what you want it to do, and then you reduce it back to this level so that it doesn't hang down over the uh, teeth and, as I said, look like a fang. Now, what would be done to complete this before you send it to the lab is that you would go back, check over all of your areas here to make sure that you have a relatively smooth area. You would probably want to leave these dimples in to a certain extent to assure the uh, excess you need so that you can carve it back in the, in the plastic. You wouldn't want these to be completely obliterated because there is a chance that if they were, you might be open a little bit, which would necessitate closing the whole thing down the same amount. If this is done for a course where this is to turn in a project for waxing up, of course, you would make this as absolutely smooth as possible. All of these dimpled areas would be eliminated and then this would be checked more or less with shim stock or some typewriter ribbon to make sure that there is contact. But if this is going to completion and it's going to be uh, made in the laboratory, this would be the stage where one could stop and remove the model from the cast and send it in. Now what this has done is this with a minimal amount of opening, we have provided a stable relationship. The maxillary teeth are caught in the splint, the mandibular teeth make simultaneous even contact in the area around centric. There is no interferences, lateral excursions are smooth, even, protrusive excursions are also smooth and even. This provides a change in sensory input to the musculature and to the nervous system that controls it and provides us with the release of the muscular tension. Another method, if one becomes more proficient in the manufacture of these bite splints, one can take a upper impression such as this one, then take a wax bite where one attempts to hold the patient in a centric relation and get the contact of the lower teeth in the wax. On this opposing side, we have the upper teeth. One would then draw the extent of the bite splint on this cast, place the wax bite on the cast, sear the wax and make the necessary additions to assure that the periphery is the same as desired. Do the same thing on the lingual surface and do all of your carving down to the level of the dimples on these surfaces and then this finished splint which should again look the same when completed as this one. So you see there's a uh, good bit of work that needs to be done to reduce this to this, but in some cases when you're more proficient it is easy to do. But the ultimate result is the same. This second method requires considerably more grinding in the mouth and as I said initially the best way and with can be done with the greatest speed is to articulate both an upper and lower model in the construction of the bite splint. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.